Next up on the number one tee. All right, today we have Lou Stagner joining us today. Hi, Lou, how are you? I'm doing well, Tori, how are you? Good. So I gotta be honest, Lou is one of my favorite Twitter feeds to follow of all places. I usually go on Twitter to see uh, sports updates, especially during the NFL season. And your feed pops in here and there. And I struggle not reposting your content to not only Twitter, but to Instagram. I just find it all interesting. All the stats and questions you pose, trivia. I don't know. It's just a, it's a lot of fun to follow. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and you're not... Uh... The, the only follower that, uh, that, that, well, let me say it a different way. There's lots of followers that think that data is pretty polarizing. So I get a lot of nasty grams from people that just don't agree with the math, agree with the data. So it's always uh, sparks some interesting conversations. Yeah, the joys of being on social media. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are many joys of being on social media, for sure. So uh, before we get started today, we're going to talk about what good golf looks like and not only from an expert level, but what does good golf look like from a 10 index or a 20 index? Like what expectations? It's really an expectation topic, you know, and what you should look for when going out on the golf course and what is considered quote unquote good golf. But I want to talk about two separate things first. One is you just gifted yourself a new electronic walking cart. How's that going? Yeah, it's great. I absolutely love it. Um, I generally walk most of the time and um, I will sometimes carry, but I used a push cart before and I switched over to an electric cart. I, I borrowed a few in the past and used them. And the difference between pushing a cart and an electric car, as far as energy goes at the end of the round, is pretty astonishing. It's like it's like playing with a caddy, right? You don't have to worry about it. You're not expending any energy moving your clubs around, which is great. Um, so it's been it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I almost had a, an accident with it though. The first time out, um, there's a button on there that you 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 click, and it turns off. Um, the ability for the remote to work. And, and then be, when you go to use the remote again, you click that button again, um, and then now you can move the cart around. Well, I'm like, ah, I don't need to do that. And so I put the remote in my pocket um, and I reached in to just put my ball back in after I hold out. And my cart was almost near the next tee and it was pointed towards some water. And I put it in and it started to move. And the, the people I was playing with if they didn't alert me, it was wet. It would have gone in the water. Uh, and so I pretty quickly realized that that button is extremely important and I can't ignore it. And so I use it diligently every time now. That is that is too funny. And, and I am a consumer of all things golf. I mean, I but for some reason... I have yet to buy an electronic walk cart. I do love to walk and I do love my walking cart, but I don't know. It, they do seem pretty expensive. Do you, so you find it totally worth it? Um, they're definitely pricey, but it, it, it is without a doubt the best other than uh, working with a teacher, which I started to do about a year ago, mm-hmm. other than working with a teacher um, on a regular basis, it's the best money I've ever spent on golf. It's amazing. I absolutely love it. Excellent. And they're not paying me to say that, just so you know. <laughs> I know. Do you want to give me, do you want to give your card a shout out though? Cause you obviously love it. So yeah, I, I have a moto caddy. Yeah, they're great. I think there's a, you know, a number of brands out there that make really good product. Um, I don't think you can go wrong. Uh, there's plenty of reviews out there. I think my golf spy has some really good reviews uh, across a number of those. They're great. And uh, for an old guy like me, who's kind of broken down, it uh, gives me a whole lot more energy at the end of the round. I love it. All right. And one other thing, and I don't know the context of this tweet or reply. I think the, I don't don't know who even initiated the tweet, but it was a question of how to improve the world handicap system. And your response was, playing in member guests or C playing in member guests or something like that. What what's your what's your opinion on uh the world handicap system and how it plays a role in yeah. the guest? You know, I, unfortunately, I don't think, you know, I always joke quite a bit about member guests and people sandbagging and um 
it you know it no matter what the world handicap system does if people want to cheat they're they're simply going to cheat there's no way around that yeah you know the good news in golf is that most people are honest you know i joke about it um and other people joke about it but the overwhelming majority of people are completely legitimately 100% honest about their handicap uh so it's just a you know a few folks out there that you know twist things in their favor i don't know how you could ever solve for that. It would be very challenging to solve for that uh, and effectively solve for that. So I don't envy the folks that are are trying to create a handicap system that is perfect all the time, because I don't think that's an achievable a goal for sure. Yeah. yeah. And how's your golf game right now? Uh, you're in the Northeast, right? I'm in the Northeast. So right now my golf game is in hibernation, uh, technically, um, but I finished the season as a 2.4. Um, I played before my daughter was born. Um, I was down near scratch for a lot of years. And then I, after she was born, I didn't play that much and, you know, hovered between five and seven typically. But, uh, about a year ago, I started working with uh, a teacher, shout out to uh, Jason Giesbrecht. Uh, he's been awesome and uh, I'm hitting it better than I ever have. Um, even though I'm not the lowest index I've ever been. So I'm down to 2.4 now and pretty optimistic. I'll, I'm going to take it lower. I've never been on the plus side. I've only been down to 0.1. So my goal for the end of next year is to get to the plus side for the first time. So I got some work ahead of me, but I, I think it's achievable. Do you have an idea of what will what needs to improve in your golf game to get to that level? Oh yeah. Yeah. You're talking to a, a math nerd. So I know, I know pretty, pretty clearly what needs to happen for me. It's all ball striking. I I've, I've uh, historically been a very poor ball striker. Um, and I'm prone to some very large misses. Um, but I've done a lot to correct that not, not to get too technical about the swing, but, but my path was very close to zeroed out. Um, and, but my face has a lot of variability which mm-hmm. means I can hit it pretty far right and pretty far left uh-huh. um, and on any given swing. And that's a, sometimes it's a really tough way to play the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, I, uh, I've made a lot of changes to, to remedy that. And as my ball striking improves, uh, you know, the, the index should hopefully continue to come down. Um, everything else is, is good. Otherwise short game and putting's always been pretty good, but it's just, ball striking and it's such an important part of the game and I, I made so I made the biggest mistake when I first started playing you know more than a couple of decades ago I put so much effort into putting you know back then it was drive for show putt for dough mm-hmm. and I was never a great ball striker to begin with and so I just invested all of my time into putting to try to become as good as I could with putting and that time was probably not wisely spent as I look back mm-hmm. on it. So, but here we are and, and the journey continues. Yeah. I'm in a similar spot where I have invested the majority of my time on short game putting and wedges and, you know, it, my long irons woods and my driver definitely have suffered from it. So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that very, very similar situation. Um, all right. So let's dive into it. I am a number. Sure. I am a numbers nerd myself, and that is why I love all your feed, all your social media feeds. So, again, we are talking about uh, what good golf looks like, okay? And we're going to kind of start with uh, the fairways and work down towards short game, and then maybe at the end, touch on course management, practice, tournament golf, all that good stuff. So, let's start out with the tee boxes first, the driver. Um Give us some stats, some numbers on driving distance. Like what's the reality, you know, and even maybe get into fairways hit. What numbers look like? Well, I I know I'm pretty sure your audience is pretty heavily female. Is that that's a fair assumption? Yes. Uh, So for women in in the Arcos database, um, in Arcos, uh, their database is enormous. Um, We have creeping up on 600 million shots in total. Wow. Which, to put that in perspective, the PGA Tour has uh, ShotLink, uh, which is what they use to track all of the PGA Tour stats. They've been using it um, since 2003, 2004. 
And, and they only, they have just under 25 million shots and Arcos has almost 600 million. So it's an enormous amount of data. So there's really not many questions that, that we can't answer because we have so much data on it. So and the women- actually, actually, sorry, Lou, before yeah. you move forward, tell the audience what Arcos Golf is and what product they have and how you guys are gathering that data. Sure. So Arcos uh, is a stat tracking tool um, and you buy sensors that screw into the end of your clubs. There's that little hole in the grip and you can screw sensors in there. Um, if you don't like the screw in sensors, we, we sell grips that have the sensors embedded in them. Uh, and then you there's an app on your phone and you have two options. You can either one, um, put your phone in your front pocket. Or we have a really small device called a link. And I'm, I know people can't see this. I'm holding it up. It's really tiny. And you can either hook it on a belt or hook it you know, on the front of your pocket. Um, and that will capture all of your data for you. So um, you know, my, my wife and my daughter have shown me you know, typically, and I don't understand this, like how small pockets are, front pockets are in <laughs> women's clothes. It's crazy. Like, we're lucky you know, to have them to begin with. There's a yeah, lot. Of like, I don't under, it makes no sense to me. I don't understand <laughs> it. And then like my pockets are, you know, it's, it's like a suitcase compared to what they have. Um, <laughs> and, and so uh, the using the link overcomes that issue, you know, for women's clothing. Um, and you go around and Arcos will capture all of your data for you. So it knows when you pull a certain club out, it knows when you hit the ball, uh, it uses GPS. So it knows where you are. And then at the end of, uh, every round, you can open up your phone, go through, it typically takes a minute or two, just do a quick validation that we captured everything, make any changes you need to make. And now you have this amazing data set you can build on your game and you can get all of your stats and it, it goes beyond basic stats. So basic stats being fairways hit, greens hit, things like that. It gets into strokes gained, which is extremely valuable. That's really the measure that you want to look at to understand your performance. And the benefit of tracking your stats is knowing exactly what your strengths and your weaknesses are. So for you and I, we're, we put a ton of time into our short game and our putting. Um, and our putting probably looks pretty good on the stats. Mine does. I'm sure yours does too. But our long game probably isn't that good. And so I've used all of this data to help me understand in detail just how you know how much work I need with my driver and my irons. Uh, and I've been able to focus on that. Uh, pretty intently, which has helped me to drive my handicap down pretty quickly. So that's the real benefit of having your stats and understanding your stats is it tells you what areas of the game you should focus on, which is going to help you to get better quicker, which is what we all want. Exactly. All right. So then let's dive into the driver distance fairways hit. What do you have for us? So uh, for women uh, in our coast, the median distance with driver uh, is 170 yards. Um, okay. and 18% of women in Arcos um, have a median distance with driver of 200 yards or more. So about, about one in five golfers, roughly. You know, it's interesting. Fairways hit is, is really close to the same, no matter the skill level. Um, and it's a, for women, it's about 52% roughly, somewhere in there. It's going to go up to maybe 54%, depending on the skill level that I, I look at, or down to 50%. So there really isn't a huge discrepancy in skill level. You know, you'll have 25 handicaps that are hitting about the same fairways as a scratch player. Yeah. Um, so hitting fairways, it's something that I talk about a lot is not all that important. That's not the difference maker. Um, the most important thing off the tee is number one, keeping the ball in play. So limiting penalty strokes, hitting it OB, hitting it into hazards, that is by far the most important thing off the tee. And then after you, you are hitting the ball consistently enough where you're keeping it out of trouble, uh, then you want to you want to get longer. You want to add length because uh, that is extremely important. Very very strong relationship between what your handicap is and how far you hit the golf ball. Um, and you will see lower handicap players hit it farther, higher handicap players hit it shorter. Uh, very strong relationship. So 
I would encourage everybody out there to look into uh, you know all of the speed training devices and programs that are out there to help you get longer because that will make a huge impact on your scores. Absolutely. And how are you? How do you feel about T boxes? Is do you feel like the T boxes that should be suggested for you based on a driver distance, or do you think it should be more based off of handicap index? What's your feel on it? Um, I think there can be a mix there. So the USGA came out with the T it forward campaign uh, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. Um, and, you know, over that time period, driving distance for amateurs is pretty much unchanged as a group. We all hit it about the same distance we did 10 years ago. And I think the biggest problem in, um, in golf with respect to distance um, and the USGA and the RNA, they, they covered this um, and they've been talking about this for the last few years with their distance insight program, where they've been investigating distance and how it impacts the game. The biggest impact for women is there's not enough shorter tees. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the USGA, they, uh, if you have a, a, an average distance with driver of 175 yards, they suggest you play a course between 4,400 and 4,600 yards. And if you go and look at, you know, uh, I'm going to call it the, you know, the forward tee boxes on a huge percentage of courses, you're not going to find courses that short. No. They're, they're longer than that. Yeah. And so it is, um, it's a big problem. I'm glad they, they, they've pointed that out and they recognize it. And one of the big takeaways from what they've been studying is we need more short tee boxes. Um, and it, it would be like making PGA tour pros. So a woman that hits at 150 yards, which there's a lot of them, you know, playing a course at 52 or 5,300, 5,400 is like a PGA tour player, you know, playing, you know, close to 9,000 yards. It's just completely, it, it just defeats the purpose of golf where, you know, when you're hitting driver and then some kind of fairway wood on every single par four. Yeah. Um, and so I, I hope that we can see, continue to see momentum and that problem, you know, being more well understood um, and golf courses um, making the appropriate changes to uh, to put those shorter tees in place. They continue to build longer courses, which which make no sense to me. You know, they they, they put in these back tee boxes and these back tee boxes are for literally a fraction of the population. And you have a huge chunk of the population that needs shorter tee boxes and they're not doing anything about it. So hopefully that changes. Um, so I think that is, you know, one way to look at what tee boxes you should play. Um, and with respect to the women's game, it's, it's um, probably, you know, it, it's an important uh, consideration given, you know, how far out of, uh, out of whack most golf courses are. They don't have tees that are appropriate for how far somebody hits the ball. Um, I've always been a, a little bit more on the score side for what tee boxes you should play. Yeah. So if you are not breaking 80, 20% of the time, um, move forward, move forward another set of tees. This applies to everybody. I mean, yeah. It doesn't matter who you are, move forward. Um, and continue to move forward until you can break 80 at least 20% of the time. Once you're doing that and you want to go back, move back. And as long as you're breaking 80 at least 20% of the time, that's a that's a good spot for you. Yeah. And especially if you're someone that plays the same course more than other courses, like say you have a home course that you're playing the majority of the time, it's a totally different golf course when you change tee boxes. And it's funny how you just get set in your, in the tee boxes that you play and you don't, you don't fluctuate at all. It's a, it's, it's good for your game. For sure. Yeah. I agree completely. Um, I like when they, I like when they mix up the tee boxes quite a bit um, and you know, give you a different look, a different look to the golf course, yeah. you know, including, you know, taking, you know, uh, you know, 6,700 yard tees and, and playing it from the most forward tee box on a, on a certain par four or playing it from a lot longer than typically is and mixing it up. A lot of courses don't do that. You, you know, you'll see tees kind of in the same spot day after day after day. So I like when they mix it up as well. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So 
Let's move up to woods and irons accuracy. So genuinely, what do you find a more important stat, fairways hit or greens hit? A greens hit is absolutely the, you know, if, if I were going to track stats and not use strokes gained. So you, if you, if you're trying, if you're really driven to get better and understand your performance, um, strokes gained is without a doubt the, the only thing you should really be focused on. And so just a little background on strokes gained, it was created uh, 15 ish years ago by Dr. Mark Brody, a professor at Columbia. He worked with the PGA tour, came up with a, a way to analyze performance and they first rolled it out on the PGA tour, I think in 2011 with putting, and then they expanded it to the rest of the game. So understanding your strokes gained is the best way to truly understand your performance. Um, and the stat I would have somebody look at if they weren't going to use something that gave them strokes gain would be how many greens in regulation you're hitting. There is a very strong relationship between your skill level and how many greens you hit. Um, and trying to continue to hit more greens um, is going to drop your skill level. If you can hit a few more greens per round, your scores are going to get a lot better. Um, and it, and that just it's pretty easy to you know understand that one. Um, every time you miss a green, you know for most amateur players, it's anywhere from you know two point six to two point nine shots to get the ball in the hole. And every time you hit a green, you know even if you're not a great putter and you're averaging 2.1 putts every time you hit a green, you know, 2.8 versus 2.1. That's a big difference when you do it a few times around. Yeah, absolutely. So with strokes gain, sometimes <laughs> I feel like it's the same as that term bounce. People will explain it to me and I just cannot get it. But this is how I understand it right now with strokes gained. I'm a 10 handicap and the average 10 handicap will hit the green, I don't know, let's just say 25% of the time. If you are improving, if you're hitting it 35% of the time, that would, is that like how it works? I don't even know. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the concept. I'll, I'll walk you through how, how it works. And I promise um, I'm not going to make you go to the whiteboard and do any math. Um, <laughs> okay. So it it's, here's how it works. You basically, um, I'll use PGA Tour players as an example. Um, the concept applies to everybody, whether you're a 40 handicap or you're Tiger Woods. Okay. All the same. Um, so PGA Tour players from eight feet on the green and eight foot putt, they make about 50% of those putts. They were they average 1.5 putts from eight feet. So if you put every tour player eight feet from the hole and they hit a bunch of eight foot putts and we got and they all hit 20 putts. Um, the make rate would be 50% and they'd average one and a half putts. So that means the average shots to get in the hole from eight feet is 1.5. So when you have an eight foot putt, if you make that putt, you're only doing it in one shot. Typically it takes one and a half shots. You just did it in one. So you're a half shot better than what is typical. Now, if you take two putts, to get that in. So you miss that eight footer and then you tap in the next one. It took you two shots to get the ball in the hole where it typically would take one and a half. So you lost a half shot there. Mm -hmm. And so here's another, it's just another way to say how far you are from the hole. So here's an analogy that, that I always, that I always give. Um, how far are you from work? Like how far are you? Yeah. You, how far are you from oh. work? Well, uh, let's just say 10 miles. Okay, 10 miles. Uh, there's two ways to answer that question. You answered it in a way that most people don't. When I say, how far are you from work? A lot of people will say, oh, about 30 minute drive. And you answered it in 10 miles. So there's two ways to, to answer that question. And that's kind of how strokes gained works. So we said um, a PGA Tour player from eight feet, they average 1.5 putts. So there's two ways for us to say how far they are from the hole. The first way would be they are eight feet from the hole. And that's like you saying, I'm 10 miles from work. Mm -hmm. The second way is saying uh, I'm one and a half shots from the hole. And that's like you saying, it's a 30 minute drive to work. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so how strokes gained works is we look at where you started from and then we look at where you ended. And then we see if you are closer to the hole or farther away from the hole than you typically should be. So let's just one more simple example, a PGA tour player from 168 yards in the fairway, they take three shots on the average to hole out. So that's pretty good. 168 yards. They average three shots from the fairway. So if that tour player hits it to eight feet, they would gain a half a shot. So they started three shots from the hole and they took one shot and the ball ends up on the green after one shot. And they ended up in a spot where they're only one and a half shots from the hole. Mm -hmm. So they started three shots from the hole, ended one and a half shots from the hole, and they only took one shot to get there. So they gained a half a shot. Now, if they hit a really bad shot and they leave themselves two and a half shots from the hole, they would lose a half shot because they started three shots from the hole. They ended up in a place that was two and a half shots from the hole. And they took a full shot to get there. So they lose a half shot. So I've, I've said this a million times. So hopefully it, it makes sense in my brain. Hopefully I'm explaining it well enough where it makes sense. No, absolutely. So how would we put it in a greens? Because we originally started talking about fairways versus uh, keeping stats for fairways and hitting fairways and hitting greens. Yeah, you know, it doesn't doesn't translate directly to fairways. It doesn't translate directly to greens hit. Um, You know, you could be hitting a lot of greens um, and you could hit every green and end up 70 feet from the hole. Um, Let's say you hit 10 greens around and you end up 70 feet from the hole. And I hit 10 greens around and, and I end up 20 feet from the hole on every one of the greens I hit. Those are very different. Those are not even remotely close to the same. Um, and so, which is why strokes gain gives you a very accurate picture of how you're performing. Um, and strokes gain, the way Arcos works, is it gives you that relative to your skill level. So we're not comparing you to, you know, anyone on the PGA Tour or the LPGA Tour. If you're a 10 handicap, we compare you to all of the 10 handicaps. Yeah. And you can see relative to other 10 handicaps how you're performing. And we look at four different parts of the game. So off the tee, those are tee shots on par fours and par fives. Your approach play, which are tee shots on par threes and any other approach shot outside of about 50 yards. Your short game, so you're around the green, which is any shot within 50 yards, and then your putting. So those are the four areas that we look at. And you can see how you're doing in each of those areas compared to whatever skill level you want, you can either compare yourself to 10 handicaps, which you are, or if you said, you know, I want to be a five handicap, or I want to be a scratch player. Let me compare myself to a five handicap and see where the biggest areas are that I need to improve compared to a five. Hopefully that, that all makes sense. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. So in regards to greens hit, what are the experts doing compared to the 10 and 20 handicaps? Yeah, there's a, there's, I don't have that one in front of me, so I'm sorry about that one. I don't have that one. Yeah. You can Um, ask. Yeah. Scratch players are typically around 11 greens roughly and, you know, 10 or 15 handicaps. They're going to be like around four or five. Mm-hmm. And and don't quote me on those, but there's definitely a, a big discrepancy between a 15 handicap and a scratch player with regards to how many greens they're hitting. So we we want to hit more greens. That's absolutely critical. But like tee shots, we have to limit penalty strokes. Mm-hmm. And so you have to avoid hitting it OB. You have to avoid hitting it in the water. Um, and for amateur players, and this is true at most skill levels, Um, even down to scratch players, we really want to avoid bunkers as well. And so when you, and and this is an important concept, I think for people, when there's a fairway bunker um, in play for you off the tee, um, you are typically better shifting away from that fairway bunker. We want to avoid that fairway bunker. And, And sometimes the most appropriate target is in the rough, you know, trying to make the ball finish in the rough and avoiding a water hazard, avoiding out of bounds, avoiding, you know, putting it into a nasty fairway bunker. So, you know, fairways hit, you know, doesn't really 
um, doesn't really, uh, it's not that important. Yeah. Keeping the ball in play is important. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that too. And, and wouldn't you say kind of knowing your own game too, I play with a woman that, um, at Papago every, every season, and she just plays the course, how she knows she can play well on it, you know? So it's laying up on certain par fours that she knows she can't get on, get on in regulation anyways. So she's always laying up to the perfect spot to chip up and one putt, you know, gives her the best opportunity. So same goes for that. Just playing the course and, and having better course management. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, you know, that's definitely, you know, managing the course well is is certainly really important. Uh, I will say with, with your friend, you know, typically, you know, the rule is you want to hit the ball as far as you can, as often as you can, making sure you're taking into account penalty strokes and, you know, other, other hazards. Um, so you, you know, laying up to your favorite number it, for most people, I will, I will say that there are are some people that you know sometimes have uh, maybe a bit of the chipping yips and they're trying to avoid they have they have a whole host of other problems going on but <laughs> that's a whole most, other episode <laughs> that's a, that is a that's three episodes um, so for most people you want to advance the ball as far as you possibly can um, over the long term that's going to lower your scoring average and one of the you know one of the ways i think that's important to think of this is is thinking of your game and optimizing your game as a range of outcomes where, you know, you may decide to go for it on a par five or, you know, a, a reachable par four, you might decide to go for it and it might end up in a bad spot for you. Just because that one outcome did not go the way you like, doesn't mean that that isn't the correct play. So if I were to take a quarter and flip a quarter eight times or 10 times right now and heads came up eight times, nobody would think that, you know, going forward, heads is 80% likely. It, it's not. It's it, it was a short run of only 10 flips. So just about anything can happen. But I, if I flip that 10,000 times, there's no way heads is going to come up 8,000 times. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. So you, um, if you make a decision and it's the optimal decision to um, lower your scores as much as you can, and it doesn't work out for you that time, that doesn't mean you should abandon it um, and not do it because it didn't work out that one time. It's important to think of, you know, the longer term and a range of outcomes. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And um, is there any data that backs up because you brought up the bunkers? Is a fairway bunker more detrimental than a greenside bunker, or are they both the same? Is avoiding a fairway one more, you know, is there one that's worse than the other? Yeah, you know, they're they're both for us amateurs. Um, we're not good out of the bunkers, and avoiding them, you know, is typically uh, a, a very good uh, path of action. You know, PGA Tour players, you know, you'll hear on TV. Um, you know, the PGA Tour players and the LPG, LPGA Tour players, you know, they're trying to get into the bunker in certain situations. And in certain situations, that tr that's true. And depending on the green complex and the grass around the green, they're probably better off in a bunker. But that does not hold for, for the rest of us, for us mere mortals. Um, so avoiding that's really important, especially especially when there's on a, on a fairway bunker, when there's a steep face where you're going to be challenged to get the ball out. Um, and then around the green, um, one of the things that uh, the players that I work with that I, that I have them pay attention to is the elevation change between the surface of the green and the area around it. And so the deeper the bunker, um, and this is, you know, all, all logical stuff. You know, we didn't, you know, create anything new here. We didn't invent the wheel. But the deeper the bunker, the more elevation change between the bunker and the surface of the green, the harder the shot gets. And that's true for the, the rough surrounding the green as well. So when you have a green elevated three feet, four feet, five feet, the, the more the elevation change, the harder the shot gets. Uh, the inflection point is about two feet. Uh, so if there's more than a two foot difference, it starts to get harder. And then the, the more the difference, the harder it gets. And you know this doesn't apply too much, but the same holds true if the green is below 
um, the surrounding area. So sometimes you have these punch bowl type greens where the sides are a little bit higher or the bunkers a little bit elevated. Um, if there's more than two feet of elevation change, those shots get harder too. So um, to back to your original question, we, we want to avoid bunkers. We want to shift away from bunkers as much as we can as amateur players. I mean, and no one has ever come into the clubhouse after a golf round saying they were in every bunker today and they had a great round. <laughs> that has yet to happen. No, that, that oh. does not happen. All right, let's talk about wedges because one of the things that I, I like that you talk about regularly is expectations on wedge shots. And so maybe under, I don't know if you consider it under 100 yards or under 60 yards. Sometimes when we have a wedge in our hand approaching a green, we have very high expectations to hit it right next to the pin. So what is, what's going on? Like what are good players hitting, you know, their proximity to the hole when they have a wedge in hand, what should we be happy with as an amateur golfer, whether it's a scratch golfer or a 10 handicap, what do you, what's, what do you have for us? You know, this is this is definitely always a hot topic, um, and it's one that um, I think some folks um, uh, they they push back on a bit. Um, they they think that every wedge should be inside of of ten feet, and that's just simply it's just simply not how it works. It's just not the case. I wish I had LPGA data for this. Um, you know, the LPGA recently started. You know, tracking strokes gained, um, but it, it's not. I don't have access to it, so I wish I could give you LPGA numbers on this. But tour pros, uh, PGA tour pros, their average proximity from 100 yards in the fairway is 18 and a half feet. Which that's a wild. Um, they're not. Yeah, it's 18 and a half feet. You know that that's uh, so. If you gave them a, a 37 foot circle, um, you know that's the average proximity. You know, you know 18 and a half feet in either direction in the hole. Um, and they're only hitting about 25% of their shots inside of 10 feet. Um, <clears throat> that's amazing. Like, that's really, really good. But for a 10 handicap to, to stand out there at 80, 90, 100 yards and expect to hit a high percentage of their shots inside of, you know, 20 feet, much less 10 feet, is completely unrealistic. Um, and here's why I think it's so important to, to manage your expectations and have realistic expectations. Um, a lot of people, when I put some of these numbers out, they'll, they'll push back and say, yeah, you're just lowering expectations. And, and that's not how I think of it. And that's not how I want it to come across. So every single shot you have, I want you to pick a, a very precise target. Uh, I want you to pick a target that's reasonable for the situation. Um, and I want you to try as hard as you possibly can to make the ball finish exactly at your target. And then the, the last part of that, which is the probably the most important part, you have to realize that that's very rarely going to happen. You're going to hit that ball somewhere in a pretty large area. And the higher your handicap, the larger area you're going to hit it into. Even the best players on the planet hit it inside of a pretty big zone with, with a wedge in their hands. And so it's important to, to give yourself um, a break on a lot of these shots. And, and why it's important is you will, you will find players that are actually pretty good wedge players or whatever skill, pick any skill you want. They're pretty good wedge players. But because they have these expectations that are completely out of whack, They'll hit a shot <clears throat> and they'll hit a series of wedge shots and they'll all, they'll be phenomenal for their skill level. And they, you know, get frustrated. They slam the club back in the bag. Um, and what ironically ends up happening is the frustration that they're inflicting upon themselves actually starts to hurt their wedge game or whatever other part of the game there is uh, because their expectations are completely unrealistic. So it's really important to have expectations that that are that are reasonable um, and appropriate for your skill level. Yeah. And I mean, if we're going to go through the whole bag, the wedges are probably the, the easiest clubs to hit other than the putter. And so the further away you get, further yardage you get away from the hole, you know, 150 yards, 175, 200, even 130 the harder it is to get closer to that hole, which means our expectations need to match how hard that shot is. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for sure. The, the farther you get, the, the, the gap and skill becomes a lot bigger be- between you know, really good players and middle or high handicap players. The gap widens as you get farther from the hole. Um, and here's just a, a silly example. You know, if, if we were to have a golf competition between me, you and Tiger Woods, uh, and we had that golf competition from six inches from the hole, we're all exactly the same skill level. Um, we are going to be just as good as Tiger Woods from six inches from the hole. But if we had that from 200 yards from the hole, like we don't stand a chance. And yeah. the farther away we get from the hole, the bigger the skill gap is. And, and so, you know, one of the uh, one of the most important uh, areas for us amateur players is sort of that, you know, middle iron distance, middle-ish to longish iron distance. It's an extremely, extremely important area. And the better you get at that, and you'll get there through just better contact, um, the better you get at that, the lower your handicap's going to get. Mm-hmm. I love it. And so anything with short game as far as chipping, pitching, bunker shots, is there any expectations that we can, you know, getting up and down, is there any percentages there that you can give us? Well, I want to, I want to just, uh, if we can, I just want to go back to some wedge play really quick, yeah, just absolutely. to give, you know, something, you know, for 10 index, female 10 index. So we're going to focus on you for a second. Um, from a hundred yards in the fairway, a female 10 index player will average 3.47 shots from a hundred yards in the fairway. So a 10 index is going to think, well, I'm only a hundred yards. I'm going to, you know, I should knock this on and I should have a bunch of birdies and, and I'm going to, I should at worst make par almost all the time. I mean, it might as well go in the hole. It might even, it might as well go in the hole. Like I'm just going to kick this in, just give it to me now. Um, and, but that's absolutely not what is happening, right? You, you're, you're making par, um, you're making bogey about the same rate as you're making par from hundred yards in the fairway, um, which is, you know, that's pretty, that, that's pretty wild to think about. Even scratch players average over three shots mm-hmm. from hundred yards in the fairway. They make more bogeys than they make birdies from hundred yards in the fairway. That's surprising. Uh, yeah. And, and so it's, it's important to have these expectations that are, that are realistic and, you know, knocking it on um, and, and two putting uh, from a hundred yards is phenomenal. Um, so if it, it takes 3.47 shots from a hundred yards for a 10 handicap. So the next time you're a hundred yards and you knock it on the green and you two putt on, on that, hole right there in that situation you just gained 0.47 shots against every 10 handicap player you gain shots against a scratch player in that situation so now that is a really really good goal and good objective Um, the average proximity from 100 yards for a 10 handicap uh, 10 handicap females about 59 feet so 59 feet if you if you um i'm sorry uh, 47 feet so 47 feet is the average proximity. If you want to gain zero strokes on that on that wedge shot from 100 yards, where uh, gaining zero strokes means you know you started 3.47 shots from the hole. We said it takes 3.47, and you hit it to a spot where it's going to take you 2.47 putts. Uh, that's 59 feet. So gaining strokes on any shot like breaking even so gaining zero strokes or more is unbelievable you're not going to stay a 10 handicap if you're doing that so having that as a goal is an incredible goal to have that means 59 feet so when you're there's really not too many you know if you play a course that tucks the pins pretty good you're going to find some situations where you're going to have 60 foot putts for sure. And if you're playing a course with bigger greens, you'll have some 60 foot putts, but you typically don't have very many 60 foot putts because there's typically not too many 60 foot putts available where they cut a lot of pins. Again, that could be course dependent. So imagine a 120 foot circle around a pin that's cut in the middle of the green, 60 feet in either direction. That's a huge area. All you have to do is hit it inside of that from 100 yards as a 10 index, and you just hit a really, really good shot. Yeah. And I see just the opposite uh, with, with 
a lot of players that, you know, that I play with and my friends where, you know, a 10 index hits it to 50 feet and they're, you know, they're ready to snap a few clubs. Um, so it, it's important to, uh, to know some of these numbers. So that it gives you, you know, a, a really good guidelines as to what's good and what isn't good. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I misspoke earlier. I was using 10 index as an example, but I am a scratch call for so oh, you are. Oh, okay. That's my bad. No, Jeez, that was okay. my bad. My bad. So I want, um, with, uh, shoot, I, I thought of something to ask next and I forgot, but, um, uh, but that is basically what this episode is about though. Yeah. So how far I got to ask you a question here. So I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt. I'm sorry. So you're a scratch, you're a scratch player. I've been calling you 10 index. No, it's okay. I used that as an example. I just, um, how far do you hit the ball? I, uh, I mean, between like 240 to 250 is a good, good ball for me. Yeah. Like you are in the very, very upper percentile of not only index, right? So you're in the top 1% of, of golfers. Um, I forget exactly what it is, but it, it's, you're in the top 1% of golfers as a scratch player. And you are also in the, the top 1% distance wise. Yeah. Um, there is such a huge relationship between your index and how far you hit the golf ball. And there's some amazing programs out there for distance. I'm not sure if you've ever had any of the, you know, the distance program folks on here, but you can gain a lot of distance. It doesn't matter who you are going through some of these programs and it's so worth it. Every 10 yards of distance you gain, depending on the player, it will be worth anywhere from a shot to a shot and a half per round um, in lowering your scores. So if you're somebody that's hitting at 160 and you go to hitting at 200, you're going to gain anywhere from four to six shots just by hitting the golf ball longer in, in a and a lot of people will gain even more than that. So if it sounds like I'm stressing distance a whole lot. It's because it's so important and it is one of the very easy ways to lower your score. Yeah. And I mean, you, you hopped right up to, you know, gaining 40 yards. It, like you said, even 10 yards will make a, will make a, a valid difference. And trust yeah. me, wouldn't you rather be hitting in at 140 instead of 150 or 100 yeah. instead of 110. I mean, just those clubs, it's so much easier. So. It is. It's so much easier. I gained a lot of distance a couple of years ago. I was swinging driver about 99 um, and I got really focused on um, fitness um, and speed training. And I, I took my, uh, uh, speed with driver up to about 113, 114, um, and gained just an enormous amount of distance. And, and it took me about five months to get there. Yeah. Um, so you can see results really, really quickly. Um, and, uh, definitely I'd look into it if, if you haven't looked into it. Not you, but uh, you're, you're, you're in the top percentile. I want to be where you are. So you're in the top percentile. So I want to go back to, I, I remembered what I wanted to say. You had a tweet once that said, making net par is a solid goal. And again, par is an amazing score. And same, net par is an amazing score. Because really, if you're making net par more times than not, your handicap is going down. So Absolutely. Um, no question. Yes. Yeah, so the way the handicap system is is set up, you know, you are, and this applies to everybody, you will only beat your handicap. So shoot, you know, net par, net under par about 20% of the time. So if you went out and you played a round of golf and you had net par on every single hole, um, that round of golf, the score that you have that day would be in the top 20% of all your scores. Now, do we want to make some pars on, on holes where we get a stroke? Sure. Absolutely. Um, but you know, net par is a, is a, is a, is a good outcome. Um, I would, I always caution people to not focus on outcomes. And so I, I use, you know, net par as a good goal um, as something you think about after the fact, and you don't stand on a tee box with a score in mind. I think that can be detrimental standing on a tee box with a score in mind. Now it can help you to, you know, potentially shift how you approach a hole, uh, which is okay. But, you know, but standing on a hole saying, I need to make a five, this hole, probably not a good way to, to start thinking about a hole. Yeah, no, I agree. All right. So in the putting now, is there, isn't there a big 
or there's a significant change in making the putt from 15 feet and under, or is it 10 feet? Like what's really the magic number with distance and as far as putting is concerned? That's all skill driven. And so, you know, for, I would answer this question very differently for a 20 handicap than I would for a tour player. Mm -hmm. Um, But typically, and I'll use generically, I'll use the hypothetical Tory 10 index that we know doesn't exist. Um, So for a a 10 index, um, they average two putts from about 16 feet, Um, which when you say that, it's kind of crazy, right? People don't buy that. Like like, there's no way a 10 index, technically they they average just slightly over two putts, 2.01. Um, and people don't, uh, they, they don't realize that two putting from, you know, 15, 16 feet, 17 feet is a phenomenal outcome. You've done really, really well. Like, so our objective, once we get, um, you know, to the lag zone, our objective is two putting and we're going to get there through really good speed control. So as you get closer to the hole, um, and you have makeable putts, you want to get, uh, almost every single putt past the hole to give that putt the chance to go into the hole. Now we don't want to hit it four feet past the hole because the putt's going to be traveling too fast to have a reasonable chance of going in the hole. So we need to have good speed control. And so for a 10 handicap, you know, that's maybe eight feet, nine feet, somewhere in there, eight feet around there, maybe seven feet. They want to get at least every putt to the hole, but no more than, you know, two feet past. That would be ideal. And then the farther we get from the hole, so like that eight feet to like 13, 14 feet is sort of purgatory area where we want to, we want to get, you know, as many to the hole as we can, but we want to start leaving some of our putts short. Um, And the farther we get from the hole, the bigger percentage of putts we want to leave short on the PGA tour. Uh, they leave about 50% of their putt shorts from a, from about, you know, 45, 46, 47 feet, somewhere in there. For a 10 index, that's going to be way, way, way less than that. That's going to be around 20 feet, 21 feet. And the reason we want to do that is when we are lag putting as a 10 index from 20 feet, and that's absolutely a lag putt, you're not going to make very many of those. Uh, and all we're trying to do is two putt. So we want to eliminate three putts. You're going to do that by leaving the shortest second shot possible. And the farther we get from the hole, the bigger um, north-south distance we have with our putts. So that's just how short do we leave it? How long do we leave it? What's that range of how short do I leave some of my putts and how long do I hit some, some by? The farther we get from the hole, the bigger that area gets. So if I were to have you stand a foot away from the hole and tell you to hit um, a window that's a foot long, so you know at least to the hole and no more than a foot past it, from a foot away, you're going to be really good at leaving it in that window. Mm-hmm. Now, if I asked you to leave that every putt within a one-foot window from 40 feet away, it's impossible. Nobody in the world can do that. That area you leave the putt in gets a lot bigger. So the farther we get from the hole, we need to center that area over the hole so that we leave on the average the shortest second shot possible. So we reduce the number of three putts. All of this is just a a bunch of fancy words or non-fancy words from a math nerd that says the farther you get from the hole, the more you want to leave short. And and when you get to a certain point, about 50% of your putts should be short. Yeah. So I always have 40 as the number. Hold on. Levi, stop. Sorry, my dog just snores the entire time. Every Zoom call. That's yeah. awesome. I love that. <laughs> so my number in my head is 40 feet. Like if a putt is over 40 feet long, it's getting a two putt is really good at that point. But you're saying even from 20 feet out is considered a really good two putt. Scratch players average two putts from 28 feet. Wow. So for, yeah, for you, PGA tour players. So I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you a bit here. PGA yeah. tour players, um, they average two putts from about 33 feet. Wow. Um, and so having 40 foot as your, as your mark is, you know, it's completely, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but it's completely oh. unrealistic. Yeah. Um, wow. it, what, is it, do we want a two putt from 40 feet? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you're, you're going to average over two putts from 40 feet. So you know, your inflection point is about 28 feet as a scratch player. 
and you're going to average about two or the typical uh, scratch player is going to average about two putts from there. So now if you're slightly better, um, he you said you're a really good putter, <clears throat> you know, you might, you know, average two putts from 32 feet, 33 feet, somewhere in there. You know, there are some scratch players that, you know, that putt better than professionals. Um, but they're the unicorn, like they're few and far between, we, you know, we have a lot of people in the Arcos database and I can look at their numbers and we have just a, a small handful that are, you know, putting over a long period of time, like at tour quality. Yeah. So 28 feet for you is two putts. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, um, to finish up the putting conversation, is there any data behind three putting when you eliminate the majority of three putts? you know, you get significantly better as far as scoring and handicap or, or not really you're, it's more a distance thing. Um, so this is why, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to track your stats. I've said this, you know, three or four times already, and your listeners are probably annoyed at me saying it, but it's oh, so important. It. And here's why. So we can have, um, the two ten handicap players standing next to each other. And one, and if I were to look at of all the ten handicap players, if I were to look at the best five percent putters, remember their their overall handicaps of ten, but they're in the top five percent of putters for ten handicaps. They would putt like the typical scratch player. They would be as good a putter as the typical scratch player. Now, if I took the other ten handicap player that's standing next to them, they're the bottom five percent putters. Again, bottom 5% of all the 10 handicap players, they putt about the same as a 20 index player. So you could have two players, both are overall 10 indexes. They're both 10 handicaps. You step on the first tee, what's your, what's your handicap? I'm a 10. I'm a 10 too. Cool. You could have two 10 handicaps and one of them putts like a scratch player. The other putts like a 20, which is why it's so important to know where you fit in that. Now, if I were coaching both of those players, there's one of those players where we are going to spend almost no time on putting like mm-hmm. that. We're going to do maintenance. That's yeah. all we're doing there. We're just going to try to keep it sharp. The other one needs a ton of work on putting. And so knowing where you fall um, is extremely important and will give you and your coach the information that you need to know where you need to focus and driving down you know, three putts is what you were talking about for high mid to higher handicap players is extremely important. Uh, they have way, way, way more three putts than, you know, a scratch player would have. And, and most of that's going to be accomplished by good speed control. But knowing where you where you stand on each one of these categories, so whether it's your driver, your irons, your short game or your putter, you know, tracking your stats. And I'm part of Arcos be awesome if you used it, but I don't care if you use the back of the napkin. If you're trying to get better, you need to know these numbers because they're going to make such a big impact on how you can focus your time to improve. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we got to finish things up, but I can't not ask about tournament golf. Cause again, this is one of your, one of your recent tweets where you mentioned, you know, something along the lines of tournament golf is much different than regular golf. What do you have to say about tournament golf? Yeah, tournament golf is a very different animal. Um, And so I think there's a few different kinds of golf. I think there's casual golf with your friends, which is a blast. Um, I play a ton of that. I think there's competitive golf where you're either maybe competing with your friends um, and maybe there's a few dollars on the line or you're playing in something else that's relatively competitive, maybe like a league night or something like that. And then there's tournament golf. And, and I would classify tournament golf as, you know, some big event at your club or club championship, local events, state events, national events. Um, and then the, you know, kind of the, even above that is tournament golf as a professional where, you know, if you go out and you try to qualify for the, you know, for the, the, the U S women's am, and, you know, you don't, you don't qualify, you know, you're still, you're going to feed your family that night. Right. Well, when you're when you're playing for a paycheck um, and you don't win um, and you don't make money, that that's a very, very different beast than than what we're going through. So there's different levels. And for those that want to compete and play tournament golf, um, I encourage you to start playing as many tournaments as you can get into 
everything that you can get into play as often as you can. You're going to feel a lot of different things playing tournament golf than you will anything else. And the more reps you can get under your belt, the better off you're going to be for it for sure. Yeah. And I always tell my audience too, like chase those nerves, like one tournament might've made you nervous before, but it's not making you nervous anymore. Go to the next one, then go find another tournament that actually makes you nervous and, and gets you, you know, gets your adrenaline going a little bit because it is a different animal and it will make you such a better golfer. By yeah, I agree. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So Lou, thank you so much for your time today. Can you let everyone know where to find you? I know you have a podcast and all your social media platforms, give them all a shout out so that everyone knows where to go. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It was awesome. I really enjoyed the chat. You can find me on Twitter at Lou Stagner. Um, I Instagram, which I, I, I'm not smart enough to figure Instagram. I have an account there. I hardly go on. It's at Lou Stagner golf. So if you go, if you follow me there, you probably won't see me, although I'm trying to change. I'm trying to get better. Uh, you can go to uh, loustagnergolf.com as well. I have a newsletter that I put out every week and talk about some really you know cool stat related things that you can use to uh, you know help your game improve. Um, and I guess that that's probably about it. And then uh, I do a, a podcast as well, Hack It Out Golf. I do that uh, with two co-hosts, Mark Crossfield and Greg Chalmers, who's a PGA Tour player. So it's it's a lot of fun, and we've been doing that uh, about two years now. So thanks it. again for having me. It was awesome. Absolutely. And everything is in the show notes also. If you uh, ha- are in the car listening, you can't write everything down, so check out the show notes. But thanks again, Lou, for joining us. And everyone, keep your stats. It's important. Yes. All thanks right. again, Tori. Thanks, Lou.